Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. Today's event is organized by the Moonshot Millennia program, in which 21 young research teams are brainstorming their vision for an ideal 2050 society. Their mission is to use ambitious science and technology to overcome social challenges and ensure that diverse members of society can all live in security and well-being. In July, the teams will submit their candidate moonshot goals and research plans, and some will be considered for the official moonshot goals of the Moonshot Research and Development Program. To help our teams brainstorm, we have invited a very special guest who is no stranger to ambitious and innovative solutions to social challenges. And of course, I'm talking about Taiwan's digital minister, Ms. Audrey Tang. As Taiwan's first digital minister, she has redefined the concept of inclusive government, creating, creating an unprecedented level of trust and mutual understanding with Taiwan's citizens. She has become well known for her work in containing COVID-19 and is now fighting against the recent surge of COVID-19 cases through her innovative nationwide vaccine booking platform. And recently, um, the Japanese government decided to send vaccines to support these efforts. And we are very happy to go be cooperating with our team friends in Taiwan. Today, I hope that the minister's vision will inspire our Moonshot Millennia teams and take us a step closer to an ideal 2050 society. Now, without further ado, I would like to invite Audrey Sun to give her opening remarks. Audrey Sun, please go ahead. Hello and good local time, everyone. I'm really happy to be here virtually uh, to first thank you uh, for the AstraZeneca uh, shipment, which we will put into immediate use. Uh, actually, I think the vaccination will start four days from now. Uh, so we've expedited all the processes just as you did. So thank you again uh, for the generous gift. Um, it's always good to start my talk with some cute Shiba Inu. Uh, so here is the Shiba Inu. Uh, the name is Zong Chai. Um, and in my mind, the digital social innovation relies on us using the internet to find the plurality, that is to say, the common good enough consensus out of the various different positions, rather than to use it as a way to polarize or to divide people. Uh, and a cute dog meme is maybe one of the most unifying things on the internet. Second, maybe only to the cute uh, cat meme. But anyway, so uh, this is our counter COVID um, idea, right? Uh, in addition to wear a mask, keep three Shibas away when you're indoors, uh, keep two Shibas away when you're outdoors. Remember to cover your mouth and nose when sneezing. Um, and wear a mask because a mask protects your own face against your own unwashed hand. Um, so these are very easy to remember and these are easy to uh, go viral, to share. And that's because we have a team of participation officers, the people who are responsible for engaging hashtags, engaging the public, just like parliamentary officers engaging the MPs and the media officers engaging the journalists. The participation officers find ways to engage the people. So so that people understand the science, the epidemiology uh, in particular about social distancing, the R value and things like that before uh, we get any mandated top down measures. And by far, this is what I call the digital social innovation approach of fast, fair and fun. So in my mind, uh, a ideal 2050 society should not be determined by people living in the 2020s. Uh, we should instead provide the platform for the uh, descendants, for the next generation uh, to grow, uh, to make the collective intelligence a truly assisted one, not an authoritarian one, which would entail that people in the 2020s determining the lifetime uh, of the people in 2050, which would be quite authoritarian, not assistive at all. So uh, one of the principle of collective intelligence is quick response and quick action. So for example, in Taiwan, we were able to start health inspections for flight passengers uh, starting last year, uh, first day of last year, actually, thanks to a, a civic infrastructure in the digital space called the PTT. Now the PTT, uh, it's sometimes liked to Reddit, but it's not quite Reddit. Uh, it's actually sponsored uh, for 25 years now by the National Taiwan University. The NTU students 
pet project that has been running for 25 years. It's hosted on GitHub. It's open source. It's governed in a co-governing fashion. So it doesn't have any advertisers nor any shareholders. And that means that when a new emergent situation comes, we just look into the PTT to see that it being triaged uh, and a good collective intelligence suggestion offered. That is what um, alarmed us to the Dr. Liu announced message in 2019 December of there's being seven new SARS cases in the Huanan Sifu market, which translated into decisive action because of the triaging that takes place on the PTT. And this basically says that our daily press conference also comes from people who are not even connected to the PTT. That is to say, because we have broadband as a human right, people can use uh, such services at no marginal cost by either joining a old fashioned bulletin board system uh, by engaging their chatbots, uh, which is free of charge, uh, thanks to the line technology provided by Japan uh, line corporation uh, and also even toll free numbers. So people can call into the toll free number 1922 uh, to suggest uh, for example, about uh, mask rationing. Uh, what about pink mask uh, suggested by the young boy who said, all my uh, classmates who are boys in my class have navy blue masks. Uh, what to do if I have only pink masks so the very next day? All the medical officers add a suggestion uh, of the participation officer who lives with Dashi by Inu. So he suggested that everyone wear pink for a while. Uh, and then that uh, did not just gender mainstreaming, but also explain the science behind mask use uh, in a way that goes viral without um, alienating anyone or any conspiracy theories. Uh, and the same um, idea uh, behind the mask uh, rationing map also inform our, for example, SMS check-in system. So uh, in Taiwan, Nowadays, uh, you can see in thousands, actually hundreds of thousands of different uh, places, you now see those QR code. But instead of requiring any specific application, it just requires a uh, QR code scanner that pops a SMS message. And again, sending the SMS to the um, check-in number is toll free. Uh, and as you can see, this random code is randomized so that um, it can only be used for contact tracing and exposure notification purposes, but it does not carry, for example, advertisement or other values uh, because it's not re-identifiable just by this code alone to the shop owner or store owner. And because we limit the 192 to use to only about pandemic prevention, so people can send such toll-free SMS numbers knowing that they will not be surveilled or advertised upon other than the contact tracers necessary services. Uh, and so I think the principle here is also about collective intelligence, people voluntarily participating in the data collaborative that enable the check-ins to happen, but they also do so understanding they're contributing to the commons under a very strict, specific purpose, common purpose use. And because it's built on you know, previous generation technology, it builds familiarity. For example, people receive earthquake um, advance warnings from the SMS system too. People receive flood advance warning too. Uh, and so they understand that this appears on a different layer. It's not likely that they will be reading their line messages uh, when an emergency comes, but when 192 to the SMS number notifies them, they do take heed and, and understand how to engage with that. So uh, like for people who use line, uh, we have a dedicated line bot that offers QR scanner. For people who are comfortable with Bluetooth, uh, we have a Bluetooth exposure notification app that also doubles as a QR code scanner. Uh, and even for people who are not using smartphones, like feature phones, they just type in those 15 digits into an SMS uh, app in that feature phone and then send the uh, message out. I take the uh, time to explain the details about this particular data collaborative case, because I believe that it illustrates uh, the core idea, which is the effective partnership uh, relies on reliable data, but reliable data relies on open innovation. That is to say the way of innovation that joins the various forces in the society. So instead of fighting against each other, one can see that each corner in the society is indeed contributing to the partnership of the goals. So that instead of uh, a showdown between opposing values like privacy and human rights on one side and counter pandemic on the other, we can actually innovate to bring these different values together. I understand that I'm allocated 10 minutes, uh, so I'll just stop here uh, and I look forward to the Q&A. Thank you, Audrey Sam, for your special lecture. It was very informative. I'm sure that it has inspired today's participants, the young researchers, 
and the leaders of the Millennia program. Your speech can expand their minds and broaden their visions of an ideal 2050 society. Personally, I was very impressed with your innovative approaches using digital technology. So prior to our Q&A session from my side, may I ask a question? So my question is about quick decision-making. From your speech, it seems that Taiwan began house inspection for flight passengers from Wuhan to Taiwan just the next day after Wuhan health officials announced the discovery of the, the virus to the WHO. And now against the recent COVID-19 surge, Taiwan has already succeeded in developing a vaccine appointment reservation system and is ready to make it available to the public. So um, you mentioned that the key to the success is well, mutual trust between Taiwan's government and citizens, but however, how can Taiwan make a decision so quickly? That's my question. Thank you. That's an excellent question. Um, we adopt a model that I call people-public-private partnership. This differs from the traditional um, partnerships because the people, the social sector, sets the agenda, just as the PTT sets the agenda on what to, uh, how to react to the new development uh, from Dr. Li Wenliang's message from Wuhan. Uh, this entire SMS check-in system, the specification is actually done by GovZero people. There's a group of people called G0V uh, who essentially forks the government for all the digital services that's not provided or provided quite uh, ineffectively by government website, which all ends in something.gov.tw. There's a bunch of people since 2012 uh, that provide similar services, but under the domain something.g0v.tw. So just by changing an O to a zero, like join.gov.tw, changing that to join.g0v.tw, uh, just one level Letter uh, to digit change, you get into the shadow government that prototypes uh, the kind of service that people want in the open source fashion. And because it's open innovation, that means that the fork is a soft fork. It's meant to be merged back. So once people who are designing, for example, the check-in system agree on something, and this agreement doesn't need to be very fine detail, it's not a contract, it's what we call rough consensus or good enough consensus. So once all the check-in systems developers reach a good enough consensus, uh, it, they very quickly produce a working specification. And so I call this reverse procurement. So for us, in order to implement the vaccine appointment system, that's fair or uh, the checking system that's uh, secure and privacy preserving or a mask rationing system that's fast and privacy preserving uh, we just look into the gov zero specifications and we implement the kind of api that the gov zero has already produced and so this way i think is quite unique because instead of uh, very large corporations like google or microsoft dictating the specifications of contact tracing or the state dictating the specification of contact tracing which all take time to be ready once the social sector proves already that it's the norm that people are going to uh, work with, then we just implement the people's norms and we don't face as much backlash because we already understand the leading check-in system designers, mask rationing system designers, and so on, all already produce a good enough consensus. Thank you for your explanation about the quick decision-making and the rough consensus. Thank you. So that's all for my question. And now I would like to move on to the question and answer session. And we've, uh, in the audience, we have the team leaders and sub leaders for the 21 Moonshot Millennia teams. If we are currently brainstorming research goals for an ideal 2050 society. And we have participants with many different titles, including minister, professor, doctor, and more. So to keep it simple and informal, Let's use the title "Sun" for everyone. So, if it's okay to team leaders and sub leaders, I would like to move on to the Q and A session. So, we received sub several questions from the Millennia teams in advance, and our first question is from Higuchi San, the team leader for the Ultimate Personalized Medicine Project. Thank you, thank you. Go, thank yes, go ahead. Thank you. I'm very impressed with your talk, and my major uh, major interest is stem cell therapy. And my research is how to deliver therapeutic cells to the site of therapy. So my question is about how to resolve the conflicts, uh, the humor or 
over landmark strategy to cope with COVID-19 seems to work well in Taiwan, but may not work uh, so well in Japan. So uh, when attempting uh, first introduction of new technologies or framework, there can be differences in students' willingness to accept them into society. For instance, the intergeneration conflicts. So my question is about uh, how you ever face such a conflict, and if so, uh, what was your strategy to resolve it? Thank you. This is an excellent question. In my opinion, uh, the intergenerational conflicts or the transcultural, intercultural conflicts and so on are often uh, a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. If the social media um, becomes more antisocial uh, or if the traditional media focus on the conflicts and tensions, uh, then people get into uh, this mood uh, that heightens the tensions and the differences, which would indeed make the what we call norm building difficult. Uh, and so what we should do, though, uh, is not to hate the media, but be the media, uh, as McLuhan uh, is one to say. So uh, instead of hating social media, let, let's build a pro-social social media is my answer uh, to your question. So, for example, in Taiwan, we have a public digital infrastructure called polis.gov.tw. Now, polis is a free software tool that uses assistive intelligence, uh, namely the k-means clustering the principal component analysis to get the a good enough consensus for any divisive topic. So the to topic, for example, you're looking at here uh, was back in 2015 when we first used POLIS for public national level decisions about the UberX case. So these uh, faces are my real social media friends and families who all feel very differently about UberX, uh, but they were all my friends and families and we just didn't talk about this over dinner. So, so now we know we have different opinions, but instead of uh, asking about suggestions, we first present people with the facts, that's to say the open data. And we use the polis only to gather people's feelings. There's no right or wrong about feelings. And in decision making, too often we jump straight to the voting or to the referenda instead of uh, holding a conversation like a town hall over three weeks or four weeks where people check each other's feelings. And in my experience, if we set time aside to check each other's feelings, then we do get the ideas that take best of the people's feelings and therefore produce better decisions. So, for example, I would feel that passenger liability insurance is very important, regardless of whether UberX is classified as platform economy, gig economy, or sharing economy. Now, if you agree with my feeling, you move toward me. If you disagree with me, you move farther away from me, and then you will see another sentiment from another citizen, and you can also post your own sentiments. But there's no reply button, so there's no room for troll to grow. And after three or four weeks of this assisted dialogue, we always see the good enough consensus here. And so uh, my short answer to your question is this picture. Every time we run a police conversation, we see that the ideological differences People don't spend calories on it because there's no reply button. Instead, people keep proposing even more nuanced and eclectic ideas that will then turn into good decisions because we already know that people always share such basic idea about a fair meter for the uh, taxi driver or the Uber driver. They care about the insurance, they care about registration, fair use of road, and so on. So now Uber is a local taxi company called Q-Taxi in Taiwan for some time now, and the local temples, churches, and so on, the nonprofit organizations can also organize their own taxi fleet, uh, thanks to the multi-purpose taxi uh, that's co-developed with the society, again, in a, what we call people-public-private partnership. Thank you. So it's very clear concept. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Do any of the other participants have any question on these topics? Okay. So then, thank you, Higuchi-san. Let's move on to the next question. The second question is from Akiyama-san, team leader for the post-anthropocentric values, behavioral styles, Science and Technology Project. Akiyama-san, it is your turn, so please go ahead. 
Okay, um, good morning, Audrey. Um, thank you very much for today's um, talk. Despite the fact that we, we, are, we are living in a really difficult um, situation on the containment of COVID-19. Oh, by the way, you can call me Hajime. You don't have to call me Akiyama-san, just Hajime is enough. Um, okay, um, my question is about, um, I'm actually the um, researcher on um, humanities and social sciences. So I'm really interested in the, the role of digitalization and the governance. Um, my question is about the trust or mutual trust between general public and the government. Um, listening to your um, speech, I thought that you don't have a really kind of polarized idea of government and people, but you kind of try to uh, make them kind of, kind of not mixed, but you want to see the fusion of the, the government and the individual, which is great, I think. But at the same time, historically speaking, um, we have a kind of this clear distinction between the or conceptual clear distinction between the government and the individuals and the tension between them. And I think this is one kind of traditional idea. Then from uh, my, my perspective, my question is, what what is the basis of the mutual trust between the government and individuals? I think this seems to be the key to the realization of digital governance. And also, I think this is not only important for Japan or Taiwan, but also all over the world to see how we can overcome the polarized, uh, um, polarized society. Thank you very much. Thank you. So indeed, uh, I think in order for a people-public-private partnership to foster based on mutual trust, we first need to establish the idea of a social sector. So not the third sector, not the voluntary sector, <laughs> But the social sector, uh, meaning that it's neither the, the third, like the less important, or just based on voluntary basis, but a dedicated group of people who look forward to working with both the economic sector and the governing sector, but maintains their own integrity, values, and identity. And this is what GovZero is about, right? In Taiwan, uh, we say the civic tech people are not uh, just prototyping for the government. They're prototyping with the government. Again, the government doesn't work for the people. We work with the people. But uh, to give no trust is to get no trust. So someone has to trust first, right? So the GovTech people need to trust the citizens by, uh, for example, publishing the real-time mask availability data in all the 6,000 pharmacies. That's an enormous trust because publishing real-time means that the public servant doesn't have time to review the numbers. If you, if you publish every quarter, you can make sure the numbers are correct. But if you publish upon collection every 30 seconds, it's like a distributed ledger, right? All the data bias, all the data inaccuracies in the pipeline are going to be visible. And so being vulnerable to such um, inspections and giving the trust to the citizen and not afraid of such inspections, I think uh, is extending the trust to the citizen. And so some of the citizens, such as Howard Wen, Fin Jin Kiang, uh, who developed the first map uh, rationing, um, just reciprocated by providing uh, the pharmacists with the assistation of the uh, digital technologies instead of replacing the pharmacists, our focus is on making sure the pharmacists uh, can uh, reduce their risk and also reduce their time spent. And it also includes people who are not programmers, but service designers. So Zhuo Zhiyuan here, who uh, in 2017 are fed up with the tax filing experience, uh, filed a popular e-petition that said uh, the tax uh, filing experience is explosively hostile. That was the original title. And people who complain about it, people who called for the Ministry of Finance to resign or whatever, are all invited by the participation officer. As part of our institution, we invite uh, for every uh, twice a week, sorry, twice a month, we invite people to co-create on the services that they dislike. Uh, and so, for example, the text filing system is then chaired by this lead petitioner and thousands of people online produce uh, hundreds of post-it notes uh, that redesign the service completely in 2018 to 96% approval rate, unheard of in digital service. And that's because the people who complain spend the most time to think about how to make it better. And once uh, we have this, because our procurement is based on API, so we can and actually just use them like Lego blocks. This text filing system, after a few parameter change, 
immediately became the Musk uh, pre-ordering platform. After a few parameter change, became the stimulus voucher vending program. It then became the QR code uh, SMS one nine two two check in production platform, and then now it's becoming the vaccine appointment platform. So each time by connecting it to a different database, the co-creation of design synergy improves because in the original twenty seventeen co-design, we assigned deliberately the participation officer who are not uh, finance. Uh, ministries offices as the lead facilitators for each table. So they are still career public service, that, but they may come from the Ministry of Economy, of Health and Welfare, um, of Interior, and so on. And so when they're facilitating the conversation, they take the standpoint of ordinary citizen because they're not working for the tax agency, right? They will not defend the policy. They will instead contribute their expertise to design a better. And once it's their time to produce something like that, they remember, oh, back in 2017, I facilitated this conversation, so I can use it for mask rationing, for vaccine appointment, and so on. And so uh, we even deliberately invited the Ocean Affairs Council to facilitate discussions about tax filing system. But when it comes uh, to talk about the Ocean Affairs platform, uh, then it's maybe the tax agency participation officer facilitating uh, the small group discussion because they may like surfing a lot, right? So the citizen who participate in the conversation understand the public service are there to work with them, not defending any existing policy because they too are citizens when participating in such collaborative meetings. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay, okay. Thank you, Akiyama-san and Audrey-san. And so that, now let's move on to the next question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hajime. Okay. The next okay. question is from Okada-san, and she's trying to make an ultra diversity society where no one feels lonely in the world. So Okada-san, it is your turn. Please go ahead. Uh, okay, thank you very much. So thank you for the uh, meaningful and valuable uh, your talk. Sorry, I'm a little nervous because uh, you are the person I look happy to. So uh, anyway, so uh, some of our brainstorming team so deal with the theme of happiness. And so I'm hoping to overcome social isolation by applying tacit knowledge a cyber communication platform and art to connect various individuals. So uh, while uh, linking people in this way, so uh, how can we implement uh, effective control and leadership so while still ensuring that individuals maintain their freedom and creativity? Thank you. That's an excellent question. I think the most important design criteria here is to believe that our descendants will be smarter than us. So uh, we should strive to be a good enough ancestor. Uh, so not a perfect ancestor, because we, we simply don't know how the descendants are going to use the system that we design. So the idea of Lego blocks of toolkits is very important, because if we only design a one top-down solution in the name of effective control and leadership, even if it may be very useful for that particular scenario. Scenarios change all the time, sometimes very suddenly. But if we implement the initial effective uh, way of institutions and explaining the individual uh, Lego blocks, then, for example, in API-based procurement, we specifically say if a system integrator, a vendor in Taiwan, builds a website that only serves people with sight, but not for people with seeing difficulties, then they could be disqualified for not, uh, you know, doing accessibility uh, homework enough. But we also, since 2016, add a clause that says if they make a web service only for humans to input and uh, to reach its output without considering open API, then they could also similarly be disqualified for discriminating against robots. Uh, we don't say that, but that's the effect. And, and that means that any new system can build on the bedrock of existing systems. And that means that our design, while it's useful for that particular case, is even more useful once any citizen is uh, equipped uh, with a new insight into a new emergent situation. They can simply reuse the cybersecurity audited, hardened, privacy preserving building blocks that we previously have designed but opened as an API for 
everyone to use. And that spreads the power to the edges, not concentrating it to the center. So by making the power spread to the edges, we empower the people closest to the pain. So design with that in mind, then you will not uh, do a trade off between the leadership and control on one side and empowerment to the people on the other. You will simply say, uh, this is a reference implementation, but if you can do so better, then feel free to do better. Thank you very much. So, uh, can I additional question? Sure. Uh, thank you very much. So, uh, I see so about the uh, uh, leadership. So, I directly know about the uh, uh, followership. How do you think about the followership for the citizens? Uh, the, the what of citizens? Uh, followership and leadership. So, you uh -huh. tell me about the okay. uh, leadership. Yeah. Right. Um, so, I believe that uh, the leader is not about uh, ordering anyone. Rather, it is about finding the common values out of the different positions. And in that sense, anyone can be a leader if they practice facilitation, practice um, active listening, practice technologies such as open space technology, nonviolent communication, and so on. And uh, in my demo of Polis and so on, you can see it's the same open space technology, nonviolent uh, communication, dynamic facilitation uh, skills in the social technology sphere uh, translated into a digital uh, infrastructure. So. Uh, I focus on the leadership of the space, not the leadership of individuals. Uh, in, in other words, I'm designing myself out. So it doesn't require me to personally hold each facilitated conversation. Rather, we design a norm upon which people can facilitate such um, conversations themselves. And this is important because I'm limited uh, in my own experiences. If I force myself to hold conversations on topics with people that I have no idea uh, their life experience is, then I cannot make good decisions. So in that sense, I'm just designing the norms that they can use so that everyone can hold their own police conversations and town halls and so on. And I become a follower of the norm that I myself help set, but do not actually operate. Thank you very much. I see. Thank, Thank you, you Okada-san, Okada for your great questions. So now let's move on to the next question. The next question is from Kumagai-san, and he has been researching into social implementation of ideal mental states based on traditional wisdom. So, Kumagai-san, please go ahead. Well, thank you very much. Um, but, uh, thank you very much for your uh, great talk. And I am really touched uh, by your discussion and by your talk. I really love Taiwan and Taiwanese food and sweets. <laughs> yes. And uh, yeah, uh, I really appreciate your activities, uh, especially uh, about the uh, mask and purchase system. And uh, you integrated uh, cyber space and physical space better. I think that you added compassion and kindness to the system. I really appreciate your activities. And uh, thanks to the advances in science and technology, human can, uh, humankind can enjoy material abundance. Uh, on the other hand, mental problems are uh, often left behind. For example, uh, after completion of uh, watching, people started to fight uh, to, you know, uh, or take uh, as much as, uh, as, as much number as uh, possible. And uh, so uh, my research team is focusing on human mind. And uh, we are now uh, trying to integrate uh, traditional wisdom and cutting edge science to develop a new technology called psychic navigation, psych navigation system, which supports the human mind and contribute to the well being and well being of uh, human and society. And I have a question uh, for you. And uh, um, you have used uh, programming and computing to build large cyber spaces, which is a collection of uh, intelligence and information. And I'd like to ask you uh, about your understanding of the concept of human mind and humanity. And what is your conception of human mind and humanity? And how do you think uh, it applies to the creation of digital systems? Thank you. Um, in my mind, uh, we are just a vehicle of our um, conversations, communication, and relationships. So uh, the thoughts 
um, inhabit us in a sense. Uh, and I serve mainly as an amplifier, increasing the basic reproduction number uh, of the ideas worth spreading. Uh, and so taking this view, uh, I'm seeing the assistive intelligence or AI as taking place between our communication to facilitate our communication, not presiding above us to replace individuals, to take away jobs or things like that, but uh, sitting in between the human communications, which is why I draw the distinction between authoritarian intelligence, which is about top-down individual control, and assistive intelligence, which is about increasing the communication bandwidth and quality of humanity uh, as something uh, not replacing, but between uh, us, amplifying uh, our conversations. Uh, and so uh, for the digital uh, system design, I find some words, uh, for example, um, virtual reality <laughs> and things like that seems to suggest a different direction where people are trapped into their own realities. And that does have an effect on the human mind because when people uh, live in different realities, sympathies are less likely to develop. It's less likely to develop uh, sympathy into empathies and so on. So uh, in my job description, which I wrote in 2016, a month before becoming the digital minister, uh, I try to outline the differences uh, between the authoritarian view uh, of AI and the assistive view of AI. So I'll just quickly read uh, my uh, job description, which goes like this. When we see the Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear the singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. Hope that answers some part of your question. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, Kumagai-san. And so let's move on to the next question. The next question is from Kado-san. And he has been considering innovative technologies for typhoon control and typhoon power generation. So, Kado-san, please go ahead. Uh, hi, Odor-san. Uh, it's a great honor to talk to you, my colleagues and my uh, family, and me, definitely. Uh, and then my question is about the human interve intervention uh, in the natural environment. So the, my, uh, my question is two points. One point is what are the most important steps to create disaster resilient society by 2050? And the second one is to what extent should human beings be allowed to disturb the natural environment? Sorry, be allowed by whom? Uh, sorry, uh, to what extent should human beings be allowed to, allowed to disturb the natural environment? That, that's right, but allowed by whom? Is there something above human beings that allows oh. us to disturb? So, so my point is that can human beings can change or control the natural environment? Okay, okay, for thank human you. beings. Okay, okay, right. So it, it's more like a ethical question. It's not a, a capacity question yeah, because yeah. the capacity question doesn't really have a answer. Um, so um, I, I think uh, the ethics question depends on the local social norm. And for things like the pandemic or the climate change and so on, the most difficult challenge is norm building because norm building requires shared values and shared values require shared sense of urgency. We see that for the pandemic prevention efforts for the first time, the entire globe do feel like a community because we assign very similar urgency to this same task. And so we're able to build global norms uh, in a very short amount of time. On the other hand, for say climate change, um, previously uh, people who live on islands assign higher urgency <laughs> to climate change, including Taiwan and Japan. But people who live on very large uh, land masses maybe assign a less urgency on climate change. And that affects the norm building. And that then affects the kind of conversations that we need to hold in order to limit our um, you know, damage uh, to the environment and so on. So my suggestion would be to build on the shared urgency platforms such as nowadays pandemic control, but also um, infodemic 
control. That's also something that people feel, especially democratic parties, feel a sheer sense of urgency. If we can feel uh, the same sense of urgency, then we can actually understand the memes and the virus doesn't know uh, country borders. And then we can implement useful norms and building upon such Lego blocks to limit ourselves, our actions to be more pro-social because people already understand the importance and necessity of doing so. But if we uh, do uh, our action planning based on different urgencies, then what seems normal to one society may uh, look excessive or too conservative uh, by another society. And that makes it harder to implement the norms that um, do the damage control. So I think in order to be more resilient, to make the consequences of the disasters more tangible, to ordinary citizens. That's the most important. In Taiwan, uh, for example, our presidential hackathon every year awards five trophies to five social innovation teams that raise such awareness. Last year is all about climate change and action and mitigation. Uh, and so there's a, a Japanese app called MyMitsu that shows uh, the water drinking fountains uh, near you. Uh, and the Taiwanese team took that idea, but add uh, the climate change adaptation idea into it. So not only does it show how many plastic bottles is saved, how many carbon footprint is saved? It also push notification once uh, you are about to suffer heat damage uh, from unexpected high uh, amount of heat. It also suggests other ways uh, to act in a pro-environmental way and so on. So it became like a Pokemon game uh, where you can complete tasks to uh, collect coins uh, and, and redeem uh, environmental friendly goods and services and so on. And so all this is important because without such shared uh, sense of urgency, the very is different pro-environmental and pro-social group don't act in coordination and such apps, such participation tools is one of the ways to raise the common urgency and therefore shared value. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kato san So that's, now let's move on to the next question. The next question is from Fujiwara san and he's researching social implementation of embedded cyborg technology. Fujiwara san please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Uh, thank you for your talk. Now, I'm researching about uh, implantable devices to enhance uh, our capability. So, my question is, uh, if the technology to implant electrical chips becomes available with sufficient efficiency and safety, so do you think its usage will be beneficial to the general public people, in particular uh, patients with dementia? Do you think about that? Uh, are you talking about the kind of Nordic countries uh, who use the NFC chips for uh, identification and carry them uh, within their skins all the time? Are, are we talking about such um, just carrying card uh, implants or deeper like Neuralink implants? Yeah. yeah. The later so, part. I, yeah. The, okay. The later Sure. So um, I think this is a excellent question for the kind of consultation that polis uh, are designed for, because each society assign very different norms uh, to such things. Uh, and because a electronic implant cannot be confined to internal processing only, uh, it's inevitable that it will be linked into sensor devices uh, as well as output devices to enable, say, something like uh, mind communication, right? Mind to mind communication and things like that. And that, of course, changed the human condition. So uh, I don't think uh, the usage will be beneficial if it's only applied to the part of society that centralizes uh, the development of such technologies. It may be beneficial if the entire society established a norm of how much and when to use such technologies. Do we use it only for repairing purposes or do we implement it to augment everyone's intelligence and so on? Uh, if the society agrees on such a norm and the norm uh, is participatory in the sense that people understand the consequences and voluntarily join in it and allow a long enough time to make individual decisions, then I believe it may be pro-social. But if without such a conversation and then force upon people uh, on the values of convenience and so on, uh, then we may see things like touchscreen um, addiction only amplified like 10,000 times. Uh, many episodes in Black Mirror uh, depict uh, such uh, scenarios. 
Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So I think the next question will be the last question. And the next the question is from Ueno-san. His research is about dynamic living space by projectable infrastructure technology. So Ueno-san, please go ahead. Ah, maybe your microphone's off. <laughs> Sorry, can I, can I hear me? Maybe you could speak a I bit you're louder. a little bit soft. I, I hear you, but the voice is a little bit soft. Oh, okay. Uh, better. It's better? Yes. Okay. Ni hao tan sang and hang out in range ni. That's remit of my Chinese speaking ability. And uh, I need to proceed to my question. And if system development and introduction into society are carried out in parallel, we can expect faster development but also faster appearance of adverse effects and the original question i made was what precaution must we take when using society as a test environment of new technology like the covid 19 apps development but listening to your previous answers my question is changing first appearance of adverse effects can pick, can be picked up very easily but delayed effects, adverse effects, is very difficult to pick up. So how can we pick up those kind of delayed effects? Uh, we cannot respond to the, the, the uh, fact or something uh, immediately, but our mind is always de delayed. So how to pick up those uh, adverse effects? Okay, that's excellent. Um, so, first of all, I think there are people uh, who basically plan out more, right? So, for them, if an adverse effect comes one year from now or even 10 years from now, they're more worried about it, just as people who worry about the climate um, crisis now. But before it's called a crisis or emergency, there's already people who worry about such long-term effects of human actions. So, uh, what's important is that we need to shape the society so it's not just a few people scientists and technologists wor worry about such long-term effects, whereas most of the people think about the convenience uh, and the gra uh, instant gratification <laughs> offered by technologies on the, on the short term. If it's shaped like this, uh, then the society cannot have a real conversation. We need to build a uh, ladder of expertise like this. Uh, where every point of understanding about epidemiology, about uh, the human sciences, about science and technology and society and so on, every point uh, in this uh, population distribution, when people want to learn a little bit more about long-term effects, they know who to talk to. And the people who are a little bit uh, more informed about these in turn also knows once they want to contextualize the information they receive and send out, who are the professionals they can stick out to. And the professionals can then reach out to the interdisciplinary uh, research groups, such as the very one <laughs> gathered upon here to contextualize their discoveries and so on. And they, they can seek even more experts and so on. And so when we shape this, uh, effect of the society, then we can provide not just what we call digital literacy or media literacy or science literacy. We then offer something different. We call it the digital competence. Uh, and recently I talked with uh, Jim Mulai Song, uh, who says digital competence may be translated to Nihongo as uh, digital like judo or aikido <laughs> or something, <laughs> the, the way, the way of digital. <laughs> so uh, digital competence or digital, uh, that I think is a different take on the traditional literacy idea, which is more in the times of radio or television, where a few people speaks and many people listen. One professor lecture and many students listen. But nowadays it's all multi-directional anyway. As the yeah. professor lectures, all your students are factual checking you on Wikipedia, right? And so <laughs> when, when such things happen, the individuals are empowered to become producers of digital media, of data, of narratives, and so on. And so once they become co-creators and producers, the education is 
focus then on the competence uh, of the uh, ethics, the norms, uh, the um, contextualizing uh, mindset instead of just on the critical thinking literacy mindset as in the previous century. So once our entire lifelong education, higher education, basic education switch to the competence based curriculum where people who for example, learn about data privacy, data controllership, uh, data stewardship, like GDPR and so on. They learn so not by memorizing the GDPR, but by measuring the air quality, the water quality, uh, measuring whatever they want to measure and joining a data collaborative or a information bank. I think that's the term used in Japan. Uh, then they know exactly what those privacy terms are about instead of just memorizing it. So a competence-based education, I believe, is required so that when we develop things that may have adverse effects, the people who see such adverse effects potentials can very quickly then propagate down the ladder so that people uh, co-create um, mitigation, but instead of falling through the ladder, which is almost impossible. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Eno san and thank you, Audrey san and all participants for your questions. Uh, I would like to end the Q and A Q and A session. It was a great Q and ses Q and A session. Thank so you. Now to close, thank you. So now to close today's webinar, President Hamaguchi of JST will give his concluding remarks. So Hamaguchi-san, please go ahead. I really thank you, uh, Odori-san, for your excellent talk and impressive dialogue with us and sharing time your precious time with us and i also thank you everyone for attending today i hope it was eye-opening and inspiring experience for us and of course a special thank you to others for your talk and i really feel you are genuine leader of our time um your talk basically democracy controlled by IT, enforced by IT is a, a very important idea. I think it will be in, essential for our, our ideal 2050 society. There is a lot we can learn from your work. And actually, I read your book. <laughs> <laughs> and, and also, I have your sign here. Thank you very much for signing this book. <laughs> Uh, early this year, Japanese uh, cabinet office announced that the start of the six science and technology basic plan, the plan focusing on achieving a human-centric society supported by technology, which enable a variety of diverse lifestyle. I hope our millennia teams, everyone here, keep this in mind when propose their new moonshot goals. Technology must benefit all people and leave no one behind. Our ultimate goal for 2050 must be universal human well-being. And we got hint from Tansa today, a genuine idea we got today, so you can make it. Today's event was an example of what we can achieve together despite the ongoing COVID crisis. Let's continue to use digital tools to connect and learn from each other. Okay? And Audrey san the Moonshot Millennium teams and everyone watching today, thank you again. And until next time, please stay safe and well. Thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Hamaguchi san, for your comments. And thank you also once again, Audrey san, for inspiring the 21 young millennia teams with your vision. And your suggestions are very valuable and will surely help the teams tackle the future and research challenges. And I think we have a few minutes left. So, Audrey san, do you have any last words or messages to the millennia teams? Okay, um, thank you for the kind remarks and the excellent questions. I look forward uh, to visit Japan um, like in person. Uh, and in fact, uh, I've learned that uh, just today uh, that uh, I do have the second AstraZeneca shot. I had the first jab in mid uh, April, thanks to the generous gift 
uh, from Japan. So I will uh, I will receive my second dose of AstraZeneca thanks to the Japanese people, uh, likely later this month, uh, which means that I'm safe to travel by July or at latest August. Uh, and so it means that in the second half of the year, I look forward to visit Japan in person, and I also look forward to meet you in person once we're all vaccinated uh, and we get uh, over this pandemic together. Uh, until uh, that time, live long and prosper. Thank you very much. And once again, thank you so much. And yes, now I would like to end today's webinar. Thank you. Bye bye and shake hands. Bye. bye.